morning, everybody. My name is Saul Miller. I am one of the portfolio managers that oversees the Ned Group Investment Balanced Fund. The aim of the fund is to outperform CPI by over 4% per annum and to protect against downside capital losses over time. I'm just going to start with a quick overview of how we see the world in South Africa, and then I'll obviously expand on these points a little bit later in the presentation. We've seen SA assets, whether it's our currency or our bonds or our equity, come under tremendous pressure over the last year. It's not surprising, given that we've seen quite a lot of pressure in terms of load shedding, failing infrastructure, and as well as our controversial stance or our political stance towards Russia, which also hasn't helped either. Um, in addition to that, we've had quite a lackluster reopening in China, which is not unsurprising. Usually when China has gone into a downturn, um, they have usually stimulated quite aggressively to get out of that downturn. They haven't done it this time. And so as a result, we haven't seen commodity prices being buoyed as they usually are. And that's obviously important to South Africa since we are quite, demand, quite dependent on commodity prices in terms of our trade account and our, and our budget balance, obviously via taxation. So that's also held back South Africa, but nonetheless, we do think China will continue to stimulate at least incrementally, which should be positive for, for Chinese assets. We think Chinese assets are also quite cheap at the moment. In other words, we quite like Chinese assets currently, given that we do expect some incremental stimulus and we also like the valuations relative to where they sit compared to history. On the other side of the world, in the US, we actually have quite a strong economy driven by very strong US consumer. However, we do have very hawkish monetary policy, which is starting to bite or will start to bite, we think, eventually. And that obviously increases the risk of a recession in the U.S. And then in addition to that, we also have a U.S. market that we think is quite expensive. So we're very underexposed to the U.S. market currently. Just touching on the composition of returns um, in terms of what worked for us and what didn't work for us, um, we obviously had a weak RAND over the year, so all assets in our funds that are not denominated in RAND, be they foreign bonds or foreign cash holdings or companies that earn their revenues from offshore, whether they listed locally or offshore, obviously benefited and contributed quite a bit to our performance. We increased our banking exposure, our SA banking exposure, into quite a lot of the pessimism that was entering the SA market. And we've seen a bit of an improvement in SA banks from sort of levels once, you know, as, as we started seeing the RAND improving from those very heady levels of about 20 to the dollar, as that, st that started to come back a little bit. And as our bonds started to improve, we also saw some SA assets improve like banks. So that helped our performance. We maintain a sizable exposure to SA banks as we think they're offering quite a lot of value. In terms of the detractors, the major detractor would have been our position or our derivative position on the S&P 500, given our concerns around the US market. We maintain that position as we still think the US market is expensive. The other key detractor would have been our position in oil, and that's really Sassol, which had production issues. Um, that seems, to, being, that seems to, to be reaching a point where it's getting resolved per uh, an update from Sassol as of two days ago. So we still maintain our position in Sassol. We think it is very cheaply valued. I'm just going to move on to the U.S. now. Here you can see a chart of U.S. Um, rates going back about 60 years. And what you see here is we've obviously had more than a decade of interest rates that were close to zero. So highly stimulative and arguably quite artificial. Since COVID, since the, the, the sizable injections that we've seen into the consumer post-COVID, we've had quite a jump up or a rally in inflation and as a result we've had very aggressive hikes in interest rates more aggressive than we've seen in 40 years so the pain of this hasn't quite bitten yet but we think it will eventually hurt consumers obviously consumers have a lot of debt in mortgages and as you probably know in the u.s mortgages unlike south africa are fixed for very long periods of time so it takes some time for these higher rates to bite but we think ultimately it will and it is quite a headwind for the u.s economy we're seeing inflation in the U.S. coming down. In fact, it's not just in the U.S. We're seeing inflation coming down in most parts of the world, and we think that will continue at least over the short term. But the Fed will probably remain hawkish. They don't want to be seen to be cutting too early. They presumably don't want to repeat of what they had in the 70s when they went through three cycles of cutting and hiking to finally quash inflation. So we think they'll probably be quite hawkish, and that obviously puts additional pressure on the U.S. economy. In terms of where inflation ultimately lands up is quite difficult to forecast, but we certainly see more factors driving higher inflation rather than lower inflation if we look at the medium term. And there are a couple of factors that would point to that. The one would be aging working populations, 
The other one would be onshoring of of, um, of, of capacity given the geopolitical tensions that we've seen in the world and then finally the need to greenify the world also can be quite costly at least initially so those are factors that could push up inflation if we take a slightly longer term view than the next year We've obviously seen a very strong US economy a very strong consumer they have been supported by quite high COVID savings and there arguably is still another nine to six months left of that um, if we if we compare it to what savings levels were prior to COVID so that could buoy consumers for a bit longer but if you look at unemployment levels which you see on the chart here overlaid with periods of recessions you'll see also another indication of just how strong the US economy is given that we are at fairly close to record low levels of unemployment we do think the hawkish monetary policy that you're seeing will eventually bite and if history is any guide one would expect those unemployment rates to rise from here at some stage which should be accompanied by a recession and historically that has been very negative for equity markets the other concern around U.S. equity markets is the valuation side. And here what we have are the expected returns, the expected real returns of the U.S. market going back about 30 years. And what you can see here is that they're certainly of the, on the low side of where they've been historically. So over the last 30 years, there's been an expected return factored into markets of about 4.5%. It's currently sitting at a little bit below 3%. So quite expensive. Furthermore, if you compare that to what you are getting in terms of real returns from US bonds, which are at about one and a half percent, that means all you are getting is an extra one and a half above those US bond levels, which is fairly paltry as an as a equity risk premium. You would expect to get a bit of a higher return from a riskier asset class like stocks. One of the questions we often get asked is, um, isn't this expensive or this, this, this high valuation in the US market being driven by a small group of mega tech shares? So what we've done is we actually look at the valuation for the median US share. So we're stripping out that impact of some of the large expensive tech shares. And if you look here, what you'll notice is on that basis, the market is also expensive. It's not as expensive, but it's still expensive and certainly expensive relative to history. So the overvaluation that we see in the US market is fairly broad based. Yes, it is more stretched on some of the large caps, but it certainly is fairly broad based, which leads us to be quite concerned about the US market and why we have quite um, yeah, an underweight exposure here. Just touching on China, here we show you a chart of property starts in China. And what you see is that into every previous downturn over the last sort of 15 years, when, whenever China's gone into a downturn, they have stimulated quite aggressively. And that's resulted in a lot, of, a lot more property starts, but it's also pushed their debt to GDP levels up quite aggressively. They obviously can't do that. You can't sustainably keep on pushing your debt to GDP levels up. So it's not surprising that this time round, the stimulus has been quite um, modest and it's been far more incremental. Nonetheless, we think you will see a continuation of that stimulus, even though it is incremental. We're also seeing the government being far more concilia conciliatory towards business, certainly a lot more conciliatory than they seem to be at the end of 2022 after their, the Communist Party convention. So we think that's also positive for Chinese assets. And then finally, Chinese assets are also trading at fairly reasonable valuations, not just relative to their own history, which would be expected, but they're also quite reasonable relative to what else is available in the rest of the world. So we certainly think this should be a benefit to the likes of a Tencent, which is obviously held in Naspers and would talk to our, um, our, our meaningful position in that, um, in that counter. Moving on to SA, we've overlaid the RAND dollar versus load shedding stages. Really, the point here is just to highlight that a lot of the underperformance of the RAND, and it's not just against the dollar, you would see this against a basket of currencies, has been due to some of our own goals. And really, that is obviously load shedding, which would be the key one. But generally, we have, we've had our infrastructure, which has been flailing. In addition to some of our own goals and our own internal issues, there are obviously macro factors that are also impacting us. And one of them, which I mentioned earlier, was around commodity prices being lackluster. And that's really partly as a result of the Chinese stimulus not being what it's historically been. And that obviously weighs on our budget deficit. It weighs on our trade deficit as well, which is why or partly also accounts for some of the weakness that we've seen in the RAND. The positive thing you can say about SA is that our valuations are close to historic lows and pessimism levels are extremely elevated. 
And what's positive about that is it's not that we think that things will be great in South Africa or even be good in South Africa going forward. We just think the level of pessimism can just get a little bit less bad than it's been. And we've actually seen that as of the last sort of two, three months where we've seen the RAND strengthen a bit as there's been a little bit more hope around load shedding becoming sorted, at least in the next couple of, of years. So this really leads us to having some position in, um, in, in SA. We, it's a modest position. It wouldn't be at the maximum level that we would normally have. We do concede that there are certainly growth issues for SA, which are significant. We just think pessim pessimism levels can certainly be a little bit less elevated than they've been. And just to, to highlight that via the likes of one of the financials, ABSA, if you look at the share price performance of ABSA over the last... 13 years odd. Share prices have been yeah, fairly, have been very, very muted. It's been up about two, three percent, whereas dividends, in other words, the income stream that you get as an ABSA shareholder has grown at over seven percent. So you've seen quite a widening between the dividends that you get and the share price, and that's resulted in very generous valuations. It was 10. We've had a little bit of a rally over the last month or the last two months in ABSA, so dividend yields are closer to nine. So you're getting that essentially, you're getting a return of nine even before you get any growth in dividends. And I'm not suggesting you get the same growth that you've gotten historically, but even if it's close to inflation levels of say 5%, you should get pretty close to a mid-teens return in ABSA, which we think is compelling. Um, and this really talks to some of our positioning in, um, in domestic assets where we still think it is appropriate to, some, to have some exposure. Here you can see the exposures of the fund and you can see on the bottom left, you can see that we do have a moderate exposure to domestic financials where you would see the likes of an ABSA. We obviously have other, other shares in there. We also have exposure to some of the mid-cap industrial shares that are trading on very low valuations of sort of five to sevens, which we think are certainly compelling relative to history. If you look on the top right, you can see our hedge on the S&P, and that really talks to our concern around U.S. market valuations and the potential risk of a recession. And then finally, if you look at the top left, you can see our position in bonds. We have increased our duration versus a year ago. We do think that um, valuations are reasonably compelling in SA bonds. We also think that U.S. monetary policy is probably close to peak, and that should also provide some support to, obviously, to SA, SA yields. At least it should prevent them from rising up much from these levels. With that, thank you very much. Thank you for your time.